Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Gotham Writers Inside Writing. Again, this show is presented by Gotham Writers Workshop, offering writing classes of all types and sizes. You can visit us at GothamWriters.com. Moving into the show for today, a reminder that at any point in the episode, you can submit your own questions for our panelists during the Q&A portion of the show. So get your questions in sooner rather than later. There's that Q&A button on the dashboard of your Zoom window. You can submit your questions there. Uh, and today, so today we're going to be talking about short memoir writing. So let's start where we always do with a quote. This one from Isabel Allende, who said, I have more freedom when I write fiction, but my memoirs have had a much stronger impact on my readers. Somehow the message, even if I am not aware that there is one, is conveyed better in this form. We're gonna talk more about that quote later, but now let's meet our panelists. Our first panelist, a writer with numerous publications out there, including multiple novels, as well as essays in NPR, Vibe, and more, Kenji Jasper. Hello, Kenji. How you doing? Good, good, thank Thanks you for being here. And our second panelist, assistant editor at Barrel House and contributing editor at Catapult, Lily Danziger. Hello, Lily. Hi. Thanks right there. For Absolutely. Thank you both for being here. So we're going to start the show with the question we always start with, which is a definition. So Lily, let's start with you. In the simplest terms possible, what is memoir? Hmm. Um, I mean, in the most basic sense, you know, memoir is a story about the writer's life, you know, and, and using um, using either the writer's whole life or a period of the writer's life to search for meaning and, and illustrate something larger. Uh, you know, I think an interesting question in that definition, you know, people like to ask what's the difference between memoir and personal essay. Um, and I tend to be in the camp that there's not that much of a difference. You know, may, maybe if anything, it's a matter of emphasis where personal essays might focus more on the the point you're trying to make, whereas memoir might focus more on the narrative. But I really I think it's a spectrum rather than two separate categories. Mm -hmm. Kenji, anything to add to that? I would call it. Um, I say a memoir is a recollection of the truth. Uh, the mm -hmm. truth is extremely variable, and experience and how we remember things in one event can be very different. So it's like a snapshot of what what the individual writer remembers and what that writer particularly finds to be important. Mm. A personal essay, you can do a lot of things. An essay, is a, is a, it's a bullet, it's a rocket. You can transform it into all kinds of different things to achieve your purpose. But when you ask someone, you know, what do you remember? Do you remember 9-11? Do you remember when, you know, Tupac got killed? Do you remember um, what it was like when they were throwing Molotov cocktails at the White House in February? Those are specific memories that we all have. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's the difference for me. I like that. Uh, Kenji, memoir is, it's a very personal form. So how do you go about navigating the emotion that comes with an experience while still conveying with honesty that experience? Do you, do you combine the emotion with it or how do you go about navigating that? If you have a story to tell, and I, and I think in all the memoir work I've done, there are these, because I, I feel like my perspective is unique and I've always been the voice for other people, you have to have an ability or a desire to be completely transparent. Um, memoir work is raw and it requires you to go into spaces in your mind and also in your life that are uncomfortable and are like airing dirty laundry, you know, putting, putting things on the cl clothesline for everyone to see in the name of art, in the name of understanding, in the name of clarity. So, I mean, you have to have some, you have to be willing to take some blows or to take, you know, to take any criticism that's going to come from what you have to say because you believe in your message. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really I, I would say like in a way, the, the emotion is the point, right? If you just tell the story and suck the emotion out of it, it's not gonna be very interesting. And you know, that the emotion is how you connect with readers, you know, that's what they're really looking for. So Lily, when you go to write a memoir, you, you, I imagine you feel pretty vulnerable putting yourself out there. Is that something that gets easier over time or is it just always a part of writing memoir? I think it's always part of it. I don't think it gets easier necessarily, but you just figure out ways to roll with it, you know, and, and to kind of get used to that feeling in a way and, and understand that that's part of it. And it's always going to be a little scary, you know, but that that's also, I think, kind of how, you know, you're getting to the good stuff. You know, when I, when I get to something that I'm like, 
I don't know if I really want to put that out there. You know, that, that often is the thing that's going to be the most interesting and, and that most people are going to react to. If you're not scared, if you have that feeling in that pit of your stomach, you know, or if, if you're not in some way or another disgusted by it, like you might be like, you know, just like a, a child in afterbirth if you've never seen one before, that's kind of the relationship that you have to have with what it is you've done. And you got, and I find myself thinking, oh my God, like, what have I done? <laughs> I've written this thing and then I've sent it to someone and then it can potentially go to millions of people. And I'm literally standing there nude, naked in the blowing wind and 20 degree wind chill. But that's ultimately what I want, you know, yep. because ultimately whatever it is, the, the, the memoir is about look at me and look at what my, my memory of this thing is. Mm -hmm. I think there is a line though, you know, that like, yeah, there's an extent to which like it is an uncomfortable, scary, vulnerable process and you have to be okay with that and kind of lean into it. But there are also, you know, there also are some stories where maybe you actually are not ready to tell it yet, you know, and distinguishing between this is the right level of discomfort. This means I've gotten to something good versus like, I'm going to re-traumatize myself if I write about this. I'm going to blow up my life if I share it with the world and it's not, maybe not worth it, you know, learning to distinguish between those levels and types of discomfort is part of it as well. And I, I would also say to understand that at least in the process for myself and for some of my students, it comes in waves, you know, the first few graphs or the first image you put on paper um, becomes seductive enough for you to say, well, Hey, all right, I didn't just mean to like vomit on one page. Like, <laughs> let me like take that out and take the best things out of this and rewrite it and re oh, what else do I remember? What else can I add to this? Was it, you know, what was the weather like? What time of year was it? You know, who was I dating? How old was my kid? Whatever these things are, the more you become obsessed with telling the story, the more it takes over everything. It eats, it eats up one world and becomes an entire diff entirely different new one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Kenji, you brought up a point that segues into my next question, which if you don't, like if you have an experience in your life, but you don't remember all of it, how do you go about telling that story? Can, can you embellish? Can you add things in? Or do you just be honest and say, this is stuff I don't remember? What I did, you know, when I, I could start with what my memories were and then, well, who else can I, what are, the, what are the primary source individuals around me can I talk to about what else is it that I don't know? Sometimes uh, my, my, my memoir, House on Children's Street, started because I was going to, I had this idea to do this book. My grandparents had this really nutty marriage, you know, and I didn't understand it. And I was going to do these two road trips with each of them to try to understand what their marriage was like and who they were like as people. And after I got my grandfather to agree to do it, um, he passed away 10 days later. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden where I had a source, now I had a hole. And what the book became was me talking to everyone about him, about the time that, and he, he was an orphan, you know, like there were all these things against me, but I still was able to create that narrative by talking to as many people as I could, by pulling whatever re research, research sources I could. I mean, there's a way to piece it together. I mean, if you look at any, if you look at biography, biographers and, and autobiographers do that the best because they have to take everything from dinner receipts to, you know, or bar tabs or whatever it is and police reports, all those different things and put together a composite picture of what the event was. So it's, it's a combination of elements. And, and Lily, I feel like one area, one area that you might, might have to, have to uh, um, get a little reverberation there. Uh, yeah. One area that you might have to improvise a little more is with dialogue. How do you go about working dialogue in the memoir if you don't remember exactly what was said? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, kind of applies similarly ac across the board. And I think, you know, a lot of what Kenji was saying is exactly right, that sometimes the black hole, what you don't remember, can kind of become the story, or at least you can be in conversation with it and interacting with it to find the story. Um, and yeah, dialogue is definitely frequently one of the harder things to recreate, right? But I think, you know, even if you don't remember a whole conversation, if something is important enough that it's central and like that conversation needs to be in the story, there's a good chance you remember like the one or two most impactful lines, you know, and sometimes that's enough. Sometimes you just need that one line and then you summarize the rest of the conversation or sometimes you can kind of recreate a little bit, you know, as long as you're being faithful to 
the content of what was said, the emotional tenor of it, the tone of it, you know, and getting as close as you can to the way that person would speak. You know, a lot of it is kind of getting your best educated guess, you know, filling in as many of the gaps as you can through research and through, you know, just becoming really, really familiar with the characters that you're writing about, you know, and remembering that the people in your lives are now characters and, and they require character development, just like in writing fiction. Um, yeah, personally, I mean, I, in my book, I didn't end up using a lot of remembered dialogue, just a couple lines here and there, but I also did a lot of interviews. So most of my dialogue is stuff that I had on, you know, recorded. So that, that was helpful. That, that was the same thing with me. I, I, I'd done a lot of interviews and what I didn't have exact quotations for. I remember where I was. I remember the wallpaper on the walls. I remember, yeah. you know, what she smelled like, whatever it was. I, I, comp I compensated with detail what I did remember or what someone else's detail or what have you, because to me, I mean, good writing is all about pictures and images and clear, you know, just the seduction of taking someone from a completely white room, you know, into the matrix and mm -hmm. all of it just being eaten up second by second. Yeah. So Lily, can any experience be a memoir piece? It, it, does it have to be this life altering, life changing moment or can you pull something out of the mundane? Yeah, you absolutely can pull something out of the mundane, you know, and not every big life altering moment needs to be an essay, you know, <laughs> or needs to be a memoir. Um, it's really, you know, I think what you have to say is at least as important as what happened, you know? And, and so maybe, maybe you had this big, life altering realization or, you know, transformative experience in a mundane moment, you know, and if you can represent that in a compelling, engaging way on the page, I think that'll be more interesting than telling a story about a bunch of dramatic stuff that happens, you know, and leaving the reader with a so what question at the end. Mm. So I want to get back to that so what in a second, but Kenji, I want to hear from you. What has drawn you to certain events of your life to say, this is something I need to write about? This is something where I pull the truth out of? You know, probably at first, a lot of it was either things that were funny or um, subway conversations that sparked ideas in my head. Um, and what I mean by that is, is that, you know, you, you ride the New York City trains or any train system and you're on there for as short as five minutes to you catch snippets of these exchanges between people. And I, and sometimes in my fiction life, I'd be curious. It's like, Hmm, you know, where does that story go? You know, let me follow those people off the train and see where they mm -hmm. head. Um, when it, but when it comes to memoir, um, it's much more about a lot of times it's about what's funny. It's about what's visual. Um, and it's about what's current and, both what I and whatever has influenced me to come to the subject, I have to be passionate about it. It can be passionate fun, it can be passionate sexy, it can be passionate political, but it has to move me personally for me to write it down mm. and call it a memoir. So I, I have to ask this question because it always comes up in memoir and uh, Kenji, especially hearing, you know, you did interviews with, with, or you had planned to do interviews with your grandparents. How do you go about writing about other people without hurting their feelings? <laughs> well, there, there is such thing as collateral damage if you want to tell the story um one of the things that i learned uh writing you know my first memoir at 29 was that as a younger person your van your vantage point about the world is very different because what you care especially if you don't have a family what you care about is you you don't think about the fact that you're immortalizing all these other individuals you know in the work you're doing but my, I think, you know, my goal is always to be honest. And I, I've had a couple of situations where some relationships got a little, you know, rough and tumble because of things that I said. But it wasn't that I was wrong. It was because our communication about those things had been complicated and different, you know. And, and it forced some conversations that were necessary. So I do my best to tread lightly, but... I'm not writing to write a story. You know, I don't write stories or my, my experience isn't the straight nine to five, worked at the same place for, you know, 10 years kind of a background, you know? So folks, readership follows you because you, you're willing to take the chances that they're not. And the more chances you're willing to take, 
Well, the more intricate stories you choose to explore, the more your readership will trust and you'll follow you where you go. Yeah, I think if your primary goal is to not hurt feelings, you just don't write that piece. You know, there, there are ways to be delicate and considerate and, you know, you absolutely don't go into it with an ax to grind trying to hurt someone's feelings or trying to have the last word. But the goal of telling a true, compelling, complicated story and the goal of not making any waves and not hurting anybody's feelings are not always reconcilable. So sometimes you have to decide, you know, if it's more important to you to tell the story, some feelings might get hurt and that has to be okay. Or if what's more important to you is keeping the peace, then maybe you can't write that piece. So I'm curious, Lily, with, uh, with you know, we, we've talked about com conveying other people on the page. Is it a challenge to convey yourself honestly on the page? Do you ever struggle with that? Yeah. Um, trying to, you know, writing about my younger self felt like just as much of a challenge. You know, I mean, I was writing about myself as a teenager and myself as like a, as a college student and whatever. And, and, those past versions of me are characters separate from me just as much as everyone else on the page, you know, and, and having to develop that character and having to have empathy for her, you know, was, was just as much of a challenge, I think, as, as trying to fairly and completely um, represent other people. You know, I, I had a similar, sounds like similar challenge to you, Kenji, where, you know, the character who was central to my story is my father who's not, around you know and so i did a lot of um frank sinatra has a cold kind of interviewing everybody around you know around the story trying to create this kind of silhouette figure um but it feels almost the same writing about yourself right you can't see your own face uh, except in a mirror and then it's distorted you know so having to kind of ask i asked people you know what was i like what was your impression of me when we knew each other you know and getting some of that outside view was helpful as well. Yeah, one of the things you, you find is you, you, you're, the way you imagine yourself to be, the way you see yourself to be, you know, needs to be either confirmed or denied by the folks who either know you the best or in many other cases who don't know you at all. Mm -hmm. You know, someone who might have seen you on a couple of different nights at the same bar or at the same college or in your work environment, they may think a completely different thing about what your story is, but in the way that you, you tell or convey that story, there are all kinds of different roads that we follow in our lives. What, what Lily would do in that same room, sitting at that same desk with all the cameras off, you know, is what privacy is all about. But as writers, anyone, everyone who's checking this out, you know, as a writer, you give up that privacy for the sake of art, for the sake of shared experience, for the sake of enlightenment, for the sake of entertainment. So however you see yourself, I mean, if you look at what, from Tina Fey to George Plimpton, um, to David Sedaris, to what the humor in, in, in the work that they create is all about just slanting their reality in this comic bookish kind of way to the point where either they're trying to get laughs from you or they're trying to get tears from you. When, we, when you go into the process, I personally think there's only so much you can plan but the more honest you try to be, not necessarily just about did this thing happen exactly this way in my life, but what is the truest version of the story for someone else to understand? And if you can get, if you can get your, your readership to believe in what it is you're doing, like I said, once again, they'll follow you to the moon, they'll follow you to a school cafeteria, they'll follow you to a beach, they'll follow you wherever you want to take them because the voice is true, the writing is true. So Kenji, I'm curious, do you, when you write a story or a, a memoir, a personal piece, do you run it by other people, people that were involved in the story, or do you just trust that you're telling it truthfully? Um, I have, in very rare cases, I, like I, I let my mother read the memoir maybe a couple months before it came out, because I think I was just like, out of everyone, I wanted to sort of say, this is it, read it and weep, you know, if this and and what was interesting about it was that um, that was one of the times I did it. She she took about a week to read, or a weekend actually, and she called me up. And what she said to me was one of the greatest compliments I've ever gotten. She said, 
I don't know how you were able to capture what it was like living in our house growing up without being there. Mm -hmm. But I recognized everything and everyone. And, you know, I'm, you know, more or less my jaw dropped. So yeah. it was kind of like, whoo, all right, I'm glad I'm, you know. But, but I think the thing is, is that you have to welcome all the different responses you're going to get. I generally don't share things unless I have to. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I'll, I'll change where someone may be from or a description or what have you if what they say matters more. Mm -hmm. If it's about my experience with them, like Lily was saying, I have to decide whether or not it's worth it, you know, to put a relationship on the line, particularly in a nonfiction sense, for the sake of art or for the sake of what story I'm telling. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the trouble you run into with running a piece by someone else is then you're asking for their kind of confirmation of the truth, but their perception of the truth may be entirely different from yours. And, and what you're really trying to do is not represent this, you know, platonic ideal truth objective story. You're trying to represent your own perspective. So in a lot of ways, Somebody else can't really help you with that. They can only try and push you further to their own perspective. You know, so I, I don't run stuff by people. I will occasionally ask somebody, you know, are you okay with me including this detail? You know, are you okay with me using your name in a story about X, Y, Z? You know, if it's something that might reflect badly on them or something that, you know, is, is at least as much their personal story as it is mine. And I feel like it's the respectful thing to do to, ask if they're okay with the, having it out in the world. Um, but that's about the extent of it. Mm -hmm. and, and Lily, from an editorial standpoint, you know, when, you're, when you see submissions, memoir submissions, you're, you're essentially analyzing these people who you don't know, their personal experiences. Are you able to tell if they're holding things back, if they're not being completely honest? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, you can tell. You can tell immediately, you know, I mean, a lot of times I'll, it's, you know, I'll see a draft and I'll see one line that's kind of like offhand, you know, and it's clear that like, that's where the story is and you're tiptoeing around it and you're putting up all these distractions of all this other stuff that's like not really relevant or interesting. And this one thing that you kind of mentioned and it's clear, you don't really want to talk about it, but that's the thing, you know, and then I'll say, if you want to write an essay about this one piece that you were very clearly avoiding talking about, I'll take a look at it. But, yeah. yeah, I actually just last night, and I just hope she doesn't kill me um, for saying, for saying this, but I had a uh, client, a student who I'm working with, and you know, she had this line, really great description, and it mentioned, oh, and I was recovering from the edible my girlfriend gave me the night before. And I was like, nah, no, I'm gonna ask you, you know, and I asked her, are you a pothead? No. And she was like, well, no, no, I just, I was like, you know, all right, do you, do you imbibe THC in any way, shape, or form? And she's like, yes. I was like, stop being ashamed of it for the sake of the story you're telling. I know you didn't get it from your girlfriend. No, you got a stash, you know, in your cabinet or wherever else, and that's your thing. Embrace that because that makes a much more interesting, well-rounded, potentially flawed character, you mm -hmm. know, than, you know, someone that counts all their pennies and, you know, goes to church on Sunday and never has any flaws or makes any mistakes. You know, that's not interesting for most people. So I'll say that I always, I always push folks to be as honest as they can. The editor, when you're working with an editor, you know, they'll help you fix it and clean it up, you know, when it's public relations time, but get down and dirty, man, put it all out there because you have to look at it for yourself and see it and know that it's real before you can determine what your image or what the public or what anyone else is going to think about it. Yeah. We were, you know, we we're talking about hurting people's feelings, portraying other people negatively, but the real test is if you can implicate yourself, you know, you should, there's the, I can't remember who said this, but this, this saying that I go back to is like, you should be the biggest asshole in your story. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and if you're, if you're concerned with like looking like the good guy and looking like you did everything right and looking like, you know, you're, you're the, clean as a whistle protagonist it's going to sound like a lie and it's not going to be interesting mm -hmm. so i want to get into the theme of, mem of of a memoir the so what the truth the all of that good stuff um especially because the quote that i used at the top of the show with isabel allende said she 
finds more meaning in her memoirs. So it, it has to be a bigger part than in fiction. But Kenji, curious on your thoughts of that. When you approach a piece that you're writing, do you have to know the theme right away or do you just kind of write the experience and then discover it along the way? Oh man, it's, it's you know, it's Jackson Pollock. It's definitely not like, you know, naturalism, man. I, what, I, what I mean by that is, is that um, I'll have an image or a picture or an idea that I'll walk around with and I may jot down a couple of graphs or maybe even a few pages, but I don't necessarily know what that is and how that applies to something else. I, you know, just to have a broad answer, um, this year as a result of the pandemic, uh, myself and uh, some other folks formed a little writing group Saturday nights, you know, we got together for two hours, everyone read a piece, we critiqued, we talked, you know, it was the most social we had all been with, with within our creativity. And every week I kicked out something new uh, that was personal, that was mine, that had to do with something around me, but I didn't have to purpose it and say, oh, this is my essay collection. Oh, this is this, oh, this is that. I have to have a clear out. No, I, I enjoy the process of getting there. You know, sometimes just the rhythm of, of sitting at the keyboard and stream of consciousness following where things goes, you get a sense of where your subconscious is, where your higher self is. And then you can sort of say, well, all right, this isn't really about um, my first instance being harassed by the police. You know, this is about me not feeling protected by the group of friends I was with or whatever it might be. And if I can be honest with myself about that, that changes the angle of the focus of the story. Mm -hmm. and, and Lily, you mentioned the, the so what of a piece. So do you have to have that so what in any memoir that you read? Is that like a necessary piece to make it succeed? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, by the end, you know, I, I agree. You don't necessarily have to know it when you sit down to write, but it should be clear by the time you send it to an editor. <laughs> um, yeah, you, you need that. I, you know, I usually, I usually have some idea of what I want to say by the time I sit down, but I, you know, I've started lately. I, I write slower and slower. Um, and I'm, I'm enjoying that, like taking my sweet time, you know, and, and letting an idea kick around in my head for, for a good long time before I sit down to write it. And then by the time I, I sit down, there's like, I have something to say, you know, but even then it usually changes in the process you know like you're saying you might think it's one thing but then as you start actually making the connections you realize like oh wait i thought i was building the empire state building but i'm actually building the eiffel tower <laughs> Whatever that might be. so have you ever gotten into a piece that you're really you just you had to tell this story and you just can't find what that universal truth is and what do you do do you keep digging or do you just put it aside and come back later um, yeah, both, you know, I, sometimes it's like, you just haven't found it yet and you need to keep pushing, you know, and I definitely, you know, I've, I've put tons of pieces in the scrap heap, you know, and I, I don't throw them away entirely, but I, I put them in a file to like, maybe I just don't know enough about what I want to say about that experience yet. Maybe I'm not far enough from it to have the perspective. Maybe that story hasn't finished happening and something else is going to happen. That's actually going to be the pivotal moment of that story, you know, but um, whatever it is, yeah, I've had lots of pieces that I started and then they were not quite working for whatever reason. So I put them aside and, you know, come back six months or a year or five years later mm -hmm. and it turns into something. I, I, I would, I would say the same thing. I don't, I keep a lot of stuff, you know, but you, um, you don't you don't understand if, if anyone and now and this is for everyone listening if anyone any writer anyone tells you that they only do first drafts or you know that they they just knew what they wanted to do from start to finish you know that was somebody that was working with at least two or three people or ghostwriter because i mean it's 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 feeling around the dark it's stubbing your toe you know it's bumping your head against the lamp you know what i mean because you don't you don't really, really know where it is you are unless, I, I mean, you can sort of say, well, hey, you know, I'm going to talk about this thing that happened. And um, it starts in that place. I, I'll give you a good example. And this is, you know, this is from something I'm working on. When I was about uh, nine years old or 10 years old, I met uh, uh, Robin Givens, uh, Mike Tyson's first wife, uh, who they had a very, Tell us this relationship, and she had been on a TV show, and 
I'm this 10 year old kid talking to like this beautiful girl in a, in, in, in a closed Smithsonian museum. And I could write the scene perfectly, but then it's sort of like, well, what the hell does this have to do with everything else? You know, I'm going to like highlight, cut, paste this scene and put it in a file and I'll put a number in it or a tap, and I always end up coming back to it, and it means something that works with, 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 with what it is I'm doing at the time. I would advise all, all the folks who are checking us out here to just be patient with yourself, and unless you're getting paid for it, have as much fun as you can, you know? Um, because once you get into, which I, I saw some of the questions in the Q&A, once you start dealing with editors, agents, and marketing plans, and you know who looks like you're, who sold X number of books or what have you, what's your platform? All of that is not about the creative process; it's about business. You know, so have the fun first. Have the greatest party of your life before the hangover. You know, so you know, just welcome that. Yeah, and just and be open to things not going anywhere. You know, I think I, I see that a lot of people like getting frustrated and banging their head against a wall because like, you know, you think if you have an idea, you have to keep pushing that idea until you sell it and publish it. But a lot of the process is having ideas that don't go anywhere and maybe that'll generate something new and maybe eventually you'll come back to it and use it for something. But just keep it moving, you know, keep generating new stuff, keep playing around, keep asking yourself questions and, and you know, be open to writing just for the sake of figuring out what you have to say and not every word that you put down is going to be brilliant or even usable. So you both have book length memoirs out there and you both also write short memoirs. So what's, what made that book length, Lily, let's start with you on this. What made that book length memoir book length as opposed to a shorter one? Like how do you tell one idea is big enough for that big of a medium and another one's just good for a few pages? Yeah, um, I mean, you know, the book, my book is, you know, it's my father's whole life and my whole experience after his death and my experience as a child with parents who were addicted to drugs and my, you know, there's just so many elements of it, you know, it's, it's this, this person's entire, like, creative output, life and death and marriage and parenthood and several stages of my life reacting to that. It's just, there are too many rabbit holes off of that central story for it to be an essay. You know, um, there are layers, there are clearly defined, you know, sections, parts of the story that are connected to each other, but they wouldn't fit in one piece. Um, so that, you know, that, that had to be a book. Um, and yeah, sometimes, you know, sometimes you have an idea and you are not sure, you know, is this a book or is it an essay? And I would say at that point, write the essay, you know, <laughs> start with the shorter version and see, you know, maybe that is enough space and, and you can say everything you want to say, or maybe you realize pretty quickly that because of the space constraints, you're only staying on the surface of the story and it's actually way more complex than that. And it needs to be a book, or maybe it needs to be multiple essays that look at different aspects of it, but they don't necessarily all have to go together in one container you know there, there are a lot of ways to approach it but I think you know just experimenting and seeing where the boundaries are and if they work to contain the story or if they are limiting it that's, that's what you have to do well um I think I'll say that there need there's definitely needs to be a larger sense of drive in anything book length that you do for me obviously it's it, it, the memoir the book length, the lo longer book length memoir that I did started out with grief. It's like, wow, okay, the patriarch in this family is gone. Um, he passed away in his bathtub. He was, you know, 82 years old. These are things I know. There are all these things we know about this person. And at the funeral, I realized this man meant something different to every one of his children mm -hmm. and his wife. That was coupled on the flip side with the fact that I had an experience where I thought I was going to be a father. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather in my in, in my in my own young mind was like the antithesis of what I thought like the kind of dad I wanted to be. But here mm -hmm. he was in passing, respected by his community, you know, respected by his children. Um, his voice always mattered no matter where he was. And it was kind of 
what this journey is about is me deciding what kind of a father it is that I want to be. And, you know, mm-hmm. the, the irony of all ironies in the, in the course of my journey was I didn't end up um, fathering that child in the way that I thought. But, um, but I got a chance to see the, that stern view that we have of older people or of the alpha males or whatever it is, whatever issues that folks are struggling with. Um, once you get underneath and you talk to enough people and you look at all the layers and you pull open the file drawers and the closet and all those things, you realize that that kind of black and white idea that you have as a younger person about good and evil or wrong and right or balanced imbalance, we're all just living in different positions moment to moment, you know, and it's less about judgment and more about understanding. So a book like the journey is about not only the transformation of the people involved, but also about the reader's transformation while reading the story. Yeah, and I think something you said there is really important too, the drive. You know, it, it has to be a story that you care enough about to spend, you know, one to 20 years <laughs> writing about and, you know, that you're going to keep going and keep digging and keep finding better ways to say it and that rejection is not going to stop you. You know, it, it has to be something that you have to write and that that you have enough passion about to sustain you over the process of, writing and publishing a book, which is grueling. Mm-hmm. So I, I want to get one more question in here before we got a, a bunch of good Q&A questions. So I want to get to those a little earlier today, but I want to start with Kenji, when you, how do you know when you are done with the piece, when it's ready to be sent out into the world? What is that moment where you're like, okay, I can't do anything more here? Hmm. I think there's a point. Sometimes it's deadlines because Lord knows, man, if I, if there aren't deadlines, man, Writers will tinker with something, you know, forever. Oh, I don't like this. I don't like that. This doesn't work. I think when it came with my memoir, I got, I had the ending before. Like, uh, I, you know, I ran into the woman on the street who I was, we were going to have a child together. And it was really sort of somber sort of moment. And I was like, okay, in my life, this is the ending. But I had to make sure in my outline to get all the other points that the book outline hit you know, and then translate my ep- conclusion epilogue into something that finished with this picture. So when I had the final picture that I, I knew I was ready for, you know, that, that was when I was like, okay, clip it, here it is, send it to my editors, you know. Um, and, you know, if I had to do it all over again, I would have I would have probably done another edit on the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, yeah, like, the, I, I think there's kind of, a point in the pit of your stomach when you know you're empty, you know, when you're done, you're good. You have to hand it off to someone else to get some perspective. Um, but that usually comes after going through it exhaustively, going through it until you hate it, going through it until, you know, you can't wait to get it out of your house, out your life, like a bad house guest, you know? Uh, and then when it's over with, you can't wait to do the next one. It, that's just, that's the joy and the beauty of the art form. Mm-hmm. Lily, how about you? How do you know when a piece is done? Yeah, you know, I think personally, you know, with my book at least, I thought it was done several times before it actually was, you know, so I would say when you reach that point and you think it's done, put it aside for like a couple months and then look at it again, because looking at it with a fresh perspective, you probably will realize that it's not actually done. Um, Yeah, and with essays, you know, it's same thing, but maybe on a smaller scale, you know, when you think it's done put it aside for a little while, read it again, have somebody else read it, take their criticism or don't, you know, revise it again, put it aside again. You know, I think it just, let the process run its course. And I think learning patience with the process makes you more able to trust that feeling when you feel like it's done, then maybe it it actually is. And it's not just your impatience and wanting it to be done. Mm -hmm. All right, so I wanna get into some audience questions now. I want to hear from both you on this, but Kenji, we'll start with you. How do you get over the whole, who the hell cares about my story belief? I'm assuming the others feel this way. Well, you're going to hear that from every agent, every publisher, you know, in the conversations that you have with folks that are trying to determine the validity of your product, your final product. You're going to listen to that so many times in so many different ways, shape, or form. 
my advice is for you to care enough about what you're doing to not care about what anyone else has to say about it. Because if you can't stick your chest out and be proud of the work you've done and said, hey, look, I got from A to B, I got this finished, I like it. If you don't love it yourself, you know, if you don't love it yourself, you have to rewrite it until you do. Then you can start dealing with the industry. A lot of people don't love their own work enough to fight for it. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they'll end up in editorial situations where the editor controls the process and what comes out isn't the book that they want. And the key thing is, is to be so, it's, like, it's, it's like getting married, you know? <laughs> Projects like getting married. Be certain that if you're gonna see it through, you wanna see it through for the life of the process. The project's gonna grow up, it's gonna go to college, it's gonna leave, you know? It's not gonna visit, it's not gonna call you back, you know? You just, you just oh man, you just growing up. But, but the thing is, is that you have to love it that much yourself. If you don't mm-hmm. love it that much yourself, you know, you're, you, you, it's a chance you can run into a brick wall there. Mm. Lily, yeah. what about you? I, yeah, I agree. I think that's, that's exactly right. If, you know, the answer to the who the hell cares question has to be, I care. Mm-hmm. I, I fucking care. And I, I know it's good and I know it's important. And, you know, you have to get to that point where you really believe that when people are rejecting it, it's their loss. <laughs> and, you know, you don't say that. Don't be rude and send the snarky replies that people get. But just understanding that if somebody rejects it or they don't get it or whatever, then it's like, oh, well, you know, somebody else will because I know it's good. And not saying that comes easily, but you have to just keep pushing and, and make it so good that you feel that way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Lily, let's start with you on this question. Probably a similar answer, but I still want to hear what you have to say. How do you respond to those who would say memoir is self-serving, ego-driven, or just plain me porn? I would say they don't read enough. I, I don't know. I mean, you know, not, your, not, not my problem. You're wrong. The end. Next. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 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 Kenji, anything to add to that? I'll just say, man, you know, look, in the history of, of this planet society, storytelling is a form of enter- entertainment. It's also a form of, of history, of passing on knowledge. If, if th- that's, that's, never, that's never me serving, you know, because everyone's perspective is unique. Everyone's perspective is unique to their own audience. So... And I think this is really particular, per- particularly pertinent in the 21st century wor- world where we're all broken down into channels. You know, everyone has their own channel, their own page, their own frequency. If, if it's all about sort of finding your tribe, you know, mm-hmm. then everyone has a place. The question becomes what is a publisher willing to invest in? And if a publisher is not necessarily willing to invest in what it is you're doing, but you believe in and you're willing to invest in yourself, the system is as such where you can put your work out there and still be seen and heard. So it really is all about what your priorities are going into the process. Mm -hmm. So next question, Kenji, we'll start with you on this one. Do you think journaling is a good source for memoir? And if so, any suggestions how to tame and shape the raw material that can be in a journal? (laughs) Um, I'll say journaling is very, very important. Um, I used to, uh, I used to, I used to always keep, you know, it's funny, in this room alone, there's like a stack of 10 of them. Um, but I, I used to keep, I keep uh, marble journals all the time, and I would write in them going to and from work every day. Sometimes it would be about developing ideas. Sometimes it would be about my own personal experience. It's a great way to get started, but consider um, everything you write in your journal pre-writing. Because once you start to type, to put it onto an electronic page, or once you start to treat it like an official document, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. You're gonna have to move the pieces around and put them together in the way that you get what it is that you want. That's not always gonna be the first, most journals that should be full of scribbles, torn pages, you know, a worn spine, you threw it against the wall, you know what I mean? You rolled your car over it, whatever it was, uh, because it's a frustrating kind of process, you should, um be open to the fact that you're opening yourself. So definitely, definitely start with journaling. Um, and then just from there, move into having a consistent writing schedule for yourself. Yeah, I think journals are wonderful source material. You know, talking before about past self as a character, right? So I think of 
journals, you know, when you sit down to write and you pull an old journal off the shelf, that's like having an interview with your past self, right? And it's a way to get, to have a reflection, a snapshot of how, what you were thinking and feeling at a moment in time in the past. But just like you wouldn't directly transcribe an entire interview with someone else and then try and publish that as your finished piece, I mean, unless you're doing a Q&A, but that's different <laughs> from a memoir piece, right? Um, you likewise, you, you don't just transcribe your journal page and say, okay, done, this is an essay, right? It's, it's a source to work from and to engage with and to, to pull, maybe you pull a line here and there if you said something really nicely. But yeah, most of the time journaling is more about just like processing your thoughts and feelings than it is about crafting something. So you, you still have to do that step. Next question, Kenji, I'm going to start with you again with this. Uh, how do I have fun writing a memoir when the topic is very dark? I feel my work is purposeful, but the fun eludes me. Cool. Um, what I'll say if you have a difficult topic to write about, um, there are always humorous moments in everything. And you got to think on, if, if what you're writing about isn't fun, imagine what's on the other side of the door when you get you know, through the lines then, so to speak. Um, whatever illumination you've had for yourself, whatever new relationships have developed, whatever the healing process is, if you can't imagine yourself and see yourself no longer hurting in the way you are when you're cre creating this really compl complicated thing, it can get you through because it's a cathartic process. You know, you're telling this story not just for others, but for yourself. So... Think about being done and having released it, you know, and it being out into the world, you know what I mean? And just knowing that you've achieved something that most people do not do. Most people do not finish their writing. Most people do not publish their book. Most people do not get their, their movie made. That is how it works. You know, it, a, a dedication to the craft comes above whatever accolades I think you may feel you're going to get from it or who's going to industry co-sign what, is, what it is you've done or what have you. You got hurt, you know, and if you don't hurt because whether it's giving up sleep, whether it's being frustrated, whether it's being a shoebox of rejection letters, whatever it is, you know, um, you have to be willing to brave the course to get where it is you need to go. Yeah, and, you know, I'll say – just embracing the fact that, that not everything about the process is going to be fun. Sometimes it, it's hard and sad and painful and frustrating and all that, and that's part of it. But I think, you know, you also, once you get past the first draft, you know, I think the first draft is kind of it's the most, like, immediately um, searing, I think, you know, because you're confronting these things on the page for the first time. But once you get into revision and editing, I think it's possible to have a little bit of distance, you know, and then the fun comes in sentences, you know, it comes in making something out of that experience and, and, you know, finding exactly the way to articulate what you're trying to get at. That's really fun. Even if the thing you're trying to get at is something dark and horrible. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think, you know, taking joy in the, in the part of it that is, is creating something, even if, if you're creating something out of something painful. So Lily, I want to start with you on this next question. Sometimes writing can be a very solitary act in an echo chamber. What are ways you find community within your craft or interact with other ideas beyond reading? Um, yeah, I have a writer's group, which is a you know, big kind of linchpin of my writing community. We meet every week. Um, we've been meeting for like almost three years now, and, and we take turns. We read one person's work each week, but we also you know, talk through challenges and frustrations and goals and, and whatever. And, and that's really great. Um, also going to events, you know, I mean, I know it's not the same now and you know, I really miss literary events, but I used to go to a lot of them, you know, and hear people read and hear people talk about their work and meet the authors who you want to be in community with, you know, and, and, meet other people who are there who like the same books that you like and talk to them about it. Um, that's a big part of it. Also social media, you know, I, I, especially in this pandemic, I, you know, I think 
there's a lot of horrible stuff about Twitter, but I also love it. And I, you know, I've made a lot of friends there and that's where I have a lot of day-to-day -day interaction with other writers and argue about writing and share triumphs and failures and all of that. Um, and it, yeah, I think that's real, even though it's on a screen. <laughs> <laughs> Kenji, what about you? Um, I, I started out, um, doing a lot of spoken word, a lot of, a lot of coffee houses, a lot of open mics, um, which was a great way to compete and compare with other folks and to see sort of where your chops were and to get reaction from the audience. Um, you know, and during in a pandemic, just like Lily was saying, um, you can't do that. And I also have an online writing group. But what I also do, and I, I, I sort of advise this all the time, is um, it's important to get out of where you're working and walk, run, swim, jump, teleport, whatever you have to do to just kind of see what's going on in the world outside of your creative process. Uh, wow, somebody's walking a dog, there's a car accident on the corner, there's a power outage, a tree fell over, whatever it is because you, you have to remind yourself that you're not plugged into your own, just your own reality all the time. The world continues to spin, other things continue to go on, keeping that in mind helps your story or whatever you're working on to be better. Mm -hmm. Lily, starting with you on this question again, um, do you recommend for people that are writing a book length memoir or a book of essays, publishing small chapters or individual essays online or on, on literary magazines before they go into writing the book as a whole? Um, I mean, you know, definitely you should be publishing, but don't cannibalize too much of the story that you're trying to write a book about. Um, there are a couple points in the process at which publishing an excerpt or a related essay is, is really beneficial, and that's when you're getting ready to query agents and when the book is about to come out, right? So you want to save your best stuff for those two moments. So I would say you know, publish some stuff related to it to start working on building your platform, but wait to put chunks of the actual book in the world until it's pretty much done and you're looking for a presentation. And then just do a couple and save the rest for um, when you're trying to publish. I, I'm dealing with that right now. I, you know, the process was really long for me and it you know, took like several rounds of, of submission and rejection over several years. And I, every time I went out, on submission again, I I published a couple essays or a couple excerpts, and now you know the book is coming out in a few months, and a lot of my best excerpts are out there already. You know, so I, I have to, to you know there I, there are still more excerpts, but there are a couple that I wish I had held on to. Um, so yeah, I would say it's a balancing act. Put some out there, but don't give away all the goods at the beginning. I I, I would agree. I'd also say that if you have something coming out, um, uh, you know and you do one excerpt, of, you, you pick and choose, you know, how large, how far you want that excerpt to reach, you know, but also if you're going to continue to publish and want to sort of actively build your brand, write some other things, some other different kind of things that you may be able to leverage because you have a deal. Um, there, this shows some other, other, other sides of yourself, other faces of yourself. Um, they also, what's the appetite for what the book is because the book isn't the thing you read on the train it's not the thing you read you know you know while you're waiting in the doctor's office it takes time you know it's a multiple hour multiple days sometimes multiple week investment and if folks feel like they get too much of this story before they get to the book they'll either say audio book or they'll say wait you know so I would just say have have more than one arrow in your quiver and um, you know know how to use them when the time comes. So next question, uh, probably our last question. Kenji, we're gonna start with you. What strategies do you have for the creative process of developing a story? Uh, and does it differ between shorter and longer pieces? I guess basically, do you outline it? Do you sort of build up to it or do you just dive in and see where it goes? When I'm ready to go, I'll dive in, but. At any given point, as I'm moving around, I probably have three or four or five different things that I want to do. And it's kind of about sort of saying, well, okay, which one of these things works the best 
or how I'm feeling right now. I may start on one thing and it may turn into the other thing. I'm not exactly sure. Um, but I will say that, that it's really important to, um, to, to be open and be flexible. You know, it's not, journalism is a craft, you know, but writing is a creative process. You know, if you're not spearing paint on the walls, you know, if you're not dirt, you know, you don't stub your toe, if you don't, you know, have a crying fit, you know, if you don't buy a bottle of Jameson and say, oh, the hell with it, like, you know, I just want to get away from it. Whatever, whatever your reaction to it, to what it is you're creating, give yourself the benefit of being human enough to welcome it and welcome the transformation that comes from it. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think it's, it depends on the, on the kind of piece, you know, there are some shorter pieces that you can just sit down and draft, but for me, the, the bigger, messier pieces, even I'm talking, you know, longer, more complicated essays is not just quick length, but I tend to have a long wind up period, you know, and I'll have a document of notes and I'll spend time over weeks or months or, a, you know, in a couple of cases, this period lasted years with an essay where, you know, it just as it's on my mind, every time I think of something that I want to say about it or a scene that definitely needs to be in there or somebody I should talk to or whatever, I just drop that in the notes document. So that by the time I sit down to actually write, I have pages of notes already, you know, and then I don't have to deal with like staring back at the blank page, which, you know, is often the hardest part. Um, and so then for me, like actually starting to draft is really just moving those notes around on the page, you know, cutting some that don't feel relevant anymore, starting to actually write some of those scenes, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I kind of give myself that shortcut. That, and that's the good thing about journaling for the person who asked about it is, is that you have an entire book full of notes or starts or things that can feed whatever it is you're doing. Um, yeah. Very rarely are you just going to, pull something out of thin air without developing it off the page before you start writing. Yeah. That's happened to me like twice and both times it felt like a miracle, you know, like lightning struck. That's not how it usually goes. <laughs> so I have to ask about recommendations now. If you had to recommend, I would maybe three writers or specific books that aspiring memoirists should be reading or aware of. Uh, Lily, let's start with you. Um, I mean, a couple of favorites, um, Lydia Yuknovich's Chronology of Water is up there. That's one of my all-time favorites. Um, I also would say David Carr, The Night of the Gun, um, because there's so much of the process that's visible there. You know, I talk about, it's like the open kitchen of memoirs where like he's telling you what he's doing as he's doing it. So it's a really great book to read when you're trying to learn more about the genre. And it's also just a great book um and then a couple others uh t Kara madden long live the tribe of fatherless girls is a favorite uh carmen marie machado and the dream house is a favorite um i don't know a ton there <laughs> there are a ton but those are the you know a couple that come to mind right away great thank you and kenji i say um stephen king's on writing um <laughs> i would say um there's a book it's called the war of art uh, it's a really, really, it came, it, yes, you, you, you know, uh, yeah. it's a silver book, like it's the oddest book ever, but it, it's uh, really good, really, really to the point about the writing process. And then um, I would say just because uh, I feel like everyone in America should read Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. It's not, yeah. it is not a memoir, but it captures the feeling of living a life in splinters and all these different pieces. Uh, and it's particularly about a character that doesn't really know himself or where he's going. Mm -hmm. And that makes all of, you know, more or less, it's because he doesn't know that he's taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. And even though that's a work of fiction, that was a lot about Ellison's personal experience. And if you're looking for a first person way to go, particularly from a male point of view, um, that's a nice angle to consider. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you both so much. So this has been another episode of Inside Writing, again, presented by Gotham Writers. You can visit us at GothamWriters.com. We're going to be back next week, uh, same time, same place. I think it's travel writing. Again, I didn't look at the schedule ahead of time, but I'm pretty sure it's travel writing. Uh, Kenji, Lily, thank you so much for the insight and for the discussion. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks. Nice to meet you both. Nice to meet you too. And we'll see you all next week. Have a good one.